uh, be live now on uh, YouTube from now. So I'm going just to start the, the, the live streaming. Okay? Okay. Okay, so I think we can then uh, start uh, our meeting. It's a great pleasure to have everybody, but especially to have Dr. Charles Sermon here to uh, give us uh, a little bit of his presentation. Uh, I'm going to pass the word to Bruno. So he is uh, the director of our institute and he will be presenting Dr. Charles. So thank you again for being here, uh, Bruno. Thank you. Let's, uh, let me just um, first say uh, thank you very much for Dr. Chan Sen to uh, join us today to give this talk on the 2020 view of the resolvents and specialized uh, pro-resolving lipid mediators in inflammation. And uh, uh, Dr. Sehan is uh, uh, currently the Simon Gellman Professor of Anesthesia in Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology uh, at Harvard Medical School. And uh, he is also a uh, full professor of oral medicine, infection and immunity at Harvard University. He got his um, uh, education first, his uh, uh, baccalaureate uh, uh, degree from Stonebrook University, and then his PhD from New York University School of Medicine and Medical Sciences in 82. And then he moved to the Karolinska Institute for his postdoc and the period as a visiting scientist from 82 to 86 uh, in uh, physiological chemistry. And uh, soon after, uh, he joined the Harvard faculty uh, first as a, an assistant professor in 87, and uh, uh, he's uh, at Harvard uh, uh, ever since, and now he's uh, a full professor, as I mentioned before. Uh, I actually, I had prepared a, a very nice PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation with uh, all the uh, biographic details of Dr. Sam, but uh, you uh, will have to believe me that uh, he has uh, uh, lots of awards and honors. And uh, I have two full uh, PowerPoint slides uh, of it. And uh, uh, these also uh, uh, resulted in uh, 572 uh, papers published so far. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll see a lot more coming from uh, the Sehan lab. And uh, these papers amassed um, more than 60,000 citations on the Scopus database. And uh, if uh, we look at the Google Scholar, it's even more impressive with uh, 87,000 uh, citations for uh, his, uh, his papers, uh, giving uh, an age index of 134 uh, uh, at Scopus and 157 at, uh, at Google Scholar. That's, uh, it's uh, really uh, very impressive, as uh, uh, you all know, uh, all these numbers, but most, most important and most impressive are the actual scientific contribution, contributions that Dr. Chang uh, uh did throughout this year. So his uh, role uh, in defining inflammation resolution as an active, highly regulated process involving several specialized mediators and different cell types was uh, 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 extremely important. And uh, this view actually uh, substitutes uh, uh, a previous, the uh, more prevalent view that uh, the resolution of inflammation was a passive process based on uh, basically on the dilution of the phlogistic agents. This group also uh, elucidated uh, the, the, the structure and identified several novel uh, resolution phase lipid mediators that uh, control both inflammation and the uh, return to tissue homeostasis, such as uh, lipoxins, uh, aspirin-triggered uh, lipid mediators, resolvents, and myrosins. Uh, his group also defined the complete stereochemistry of each of these uh, specialized pro-resolved lipid mediators, uh, known uh, by the acronym of SPM, and identified their specific receptors. Uh, 
they also demonstrated that these SPMs are agonists of uh, resolution and uh, uh, introduced uh, several uh, important concepts such as uh, quantitative uh, resolution indices and uh, resolution pharmacology. And, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I've known Dr. Sahin the uh, past uh, 22 years. And uh, when I was uh, uh, young, uh, um, I was still young then, uh, uh, PhD students, uh, Cristiani Bandeira de Mello and I uh, visit uh, Boston and had uh, uh, an opportunity to talk with uh, uh, Dr. Sahin uh, on, the, on the work that uh, was uh, uh, Cristiani's uh, PhD project, studying the role of uh, lipid mediators uh, in the resolution of uh, uh, allergic process and the role of uh, eosinophils in this uh, in these uh, uh, these conditions, in these uh, situations, and uh, uh, from this talk came two uh, uh, very uh, interesting papers in the Journal of uh, uh, Immunology. One uh, that was published in January of 2000. Uh, that's uh, uh, cyclooxygenase two derived the prostaglandin two and lipo like A four accelerate resolution of uh, allergic edema in angiostrongylus coccyricensis infected rats, rats uh, relationship with uh, concurrent eosinophilia. And uh, an another one that was published in the cutting edge section of the Journal of Immunology called uh, uh, Lipoxin A4 and aspirin triggered 15 epi uh, Lipoxin A4 block allergen use eosinophil trafficking. Uh, both were, uh, had uh, uh, Christiani as uh, first author and uh, counted with uh, uh, the, the collaboration of, uh, of uh, Dr. San. And these are uh, uh, obviously very important uh, papers for the both of, of us, Christiani and I, and, but they also play a, 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 a significant role in uh, Dr. San's um, trajectory throughout these uh, 572 papers. So we have these uh, uh, um, small contribution, but uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, ever since then, these uh, uh, late uh, 1990s uh, results, uh, uh, a lot of the more interesting stuff came out from Dr. Sahan lab, and uh, we are going to hear uh, about it uh, uh, today. And uh, um, so I, I just, uh, refer everybody to Dr. Charles Serhan and uh, uh, once again thank him uh, for speaking to us today. Uh, Dr. Serhan. Okay, hola everyone. Uh, this is uh, live from Massachusetts so I hope that you can all hear me and I want to thank Bruno for a very nice uh, uh, introduction and for the opportunity to uh, contribute to the celebration of the 75th anniversary of your institute. So, um, I hope you can all see this slide. I, this is, um, if you haven't visited Boston, this is Brigham and Women's Hospital, the original building here. Um, I just want to check and make sure that you can see my arrow, yes. And this is Harvard Medical School. And all of this is uh, now Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's expanded a lot in, in recent years. Uh, as Bruno mentioned, uh, I met both Christiani and uh, Bruno uh, many times when they were in Boston. And this is a picture of them. Uh, from the 1999 meeting of the Icosanoid Research Foundation that took place in Boston. And um, so Harvard Medical School requires that I show you this uh, conflict of interest slide, disclosures. Um, I have no relevant conflict of interest. I, I can point out that I'm on scientific advisory boards for several companies. Um, and have no conflict of interest uh, on material presented today. So 
I wanted to give a general overview because uh, I know this is a very diverse group, but we're interested in inflammation, of course, because today inflammation is uh, thought to be the center of many, many diseases, and it's usually portrayed as, as a villain. There are some new villains on scene, uh, of course, inflammaging, what people call inflammaging, and also the pro-inflammatory diet is something we need to be concerned about. And for all of us, inflammation touches us in some shape or form uh, throughout our lives. So it's an area of uh, self-education for us. Inflammation is uh, continually in the news. And this is an article on top uh, from New York Times <clears throat> talking about inflammation and chronic diseases. Here's a recent Harvard Magazine article covering inflammation and uh, our participation in the resolution. And here's one I like very much from France, uh, from the newspaper Le Monde in the science and medicine section, uh, talking about inflammation as the malady of the century. So, I know that at your institute, you're interested in a Chagas disease, and this is a paper that came out earlier on uh, Leishmania and how resolving D1 could help drive that infection. And also there was documentation there on the levels of resolving D1 and D2 in individuals in Brazil. Working with um, the late Herbie Tanowitz and his colleagues, uh, we found that uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, certain species, actually produce resolvins, D1, D5, D2, in this work with Roman Colis. And so it looked like that the parasites had learned how to take this system and use it to its advantage. But very recently, uh, just published... Uh, from uh, collaborators in, in, in New York and working in Brazil. And this is the late uh, Herbie Tanowitz's uh, group. They discovered that resolving D1 administration is beneficial in reducing inflammation in trypanosoma cruzi in an animal model. So what are resolvins? So in general, um, I want to give you a little bit of background um, on how we got into this area, you know, work on structural elucidation, and then I want to take you into what we call functional genomics and uh, our aim on human translation and documentation of resolvents on human challenge, and then some very recent uh, work that we're excited about, and that's dealing with... Um, the vagus nerve uh, stimulation and bioelectric medicine. And then I'll take you uh, to some recent considerations on uh, human clinical development for the resolution pharmacology. So this is my program project team. It's a multidisciplinary team um, supported by uh, NIH. So there's several different uh, groups working together. This is Dr. Bruce Levy. So internal medicine doc and pulmonary uh, colleague, and this is Matt Spite, another project leader, and um, he's working on wound healing. And overall, our group is interested in how does acute inflammation resolve and what are the mediators and mechanisms in this resolution process. And this is my own group here, a uh, very recent a shot. This is Dr. Nan Chang, and I'll talk about her contributions and Dr. Javier De La Rosa, uh, Stefania uh, Libreros, uh, and I'll talk about their contributions today. So, when we looked at uh, the decision paths of acute uh, inflama inflammatory response, um, it, it's clear that the acute response could either go to chronic or to complete resolution, and of course, ideal outcome of a, of a challenge, a protective challenge, is resolution. So the acute phase is very well studied, and there are many, many chemical mediators, chemokines, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, that play an important protective role 
in bringing about the cardinal signs of inflammation. And of course, acute inflammation could go on to chronic inflammation, abscess formation, et cetera. And we're very interested in uh, human neutrophils because they can um, not only be protective, but they can also cause collateral tissue damage by their ability to inadvertently release uh, noxic agents such as reactive oxygen species and proteolytic enzymes when they excessively congregate. And as uh, Bruno mentioned, in the textbooks at the time, uh, resolution was thought to be a passive process, just a simple dilution of all these chemical mediators to come back to uh, homeostasis. And by studying self-limited acute inflammatory responses, we learned that this is a biochemically active process in animal models. And it gave us the opportunity to do the structural elucidation of the resolvents first and a whole superfamily of mediators that I'll tell you about today. So if we look at this um, acute inflammatory response and its complete resolution in self-limited models, there's very rapid edema formation in seconds to minutes. And then this green curve here is the neutrophil entry. And then they're lost from the site. And this is very important in resolution. And then there's a non-phlogistic, non-fever-causing recruitment of mononuclear cells and macrophages to the site. So it's within this time frame that we first captured the resolvents and worked out their structures, and next the protectins and the marisins. These were all born in Boston, and the lipoxins, which were also on the cusp here, they were born in Stockholm. We used the mouse air pouch initially to do a systems approach uh, to do the proteomics and lipidomics, as well as microRNA. And this, in a self-limited acute inflammatory response, gave us the opportunity to interrogate pus in a temporal fashion. So the way to remember this system is alpha signals omega, the beginning signals the end, or the arachidonic acid products signal the utilization of the omega-3 um, products. And collectively, we call these specialized pro-resolving mediators because they have specialized functions in resolution and many other systems. They're widely appreciated now to be stop signals. And this is from science. And here you see the lipoxins, resolvins, and of course the annexin plays a role in resolution, work from Mauro Peretti and, and his group, as well as gases such as hydrogen sulfide from John Wallace's group in Canada, and also carbon monoxide from our group, uh, working with Augustine Choi. So we use these two basic cellular assays to elucidate the key functions uh, and uh, structural elucidation of the SPMs. And that is the cessation of neutrophilic infiltration that's the physiology and the pharmacology that's perceived as anti-inflammatory. That's stopping the neutrophils from diapodesing and leaving the vasculature into the interstitial space. And then this pro-resolving side, which is driving epherocytosis and the clearance and killing of microbes, as well as apoptotic neutrophils from the acute inflammatory inf site. This extends on to bacteria and also viruses and as well as uh, fibrin clot resolution as well. So as Dr. Diaz uh, mentioned, we introduced these resolution indices. Why? Because we needed to have quantitative uh, markers of the in vivo actions to pinpoint the actions of each of the SPNs in animal models. So it took us a long time to recognize that pro-resolution was not equivalent to anti-inflammation. Why? Because pro-resolution is agonist-driven clearance uh, and it does not involve inhibition, uh, unlike 
current anti-inflammatory agents. And collectively, we consider these as immunoresolvents because they stimulate resolution. So here is the view today uh, of the resolvents, protectants, and maresins. Uh, they're formed uh, from the essential fatty acids, and EPA is a precursor to E-series resolvents. I want to point out that we carried out the complete structural elucidation of each of these molecules, and that's confirmed by total organic synthesis. The D-series resolvents from DHA, and then the protectants and the maresins. The protectants, the resolvents of the E and D-series are also modulated by aspirin. That's not the case with uh, the maresins. And aspirin triggers the epimeric forms of these mediators, and they are longer acting in vivo. So we view this as a gradient in, in a contained site, such as a, a, a pustule, as a gradient of forming these molecules um, with time. And we consider this uh, the network uh, resolution metabolome. So how potent are these molecules? Well, here is an illustration of the range of potency of the classic pro-inflammatory mediators that trigger the cardinal signs of inflammation. And prostaglandins are essentially in the middle here below <clears throat> complement components, and they are nano to micromolar potency in most systems. The SPMs are very potent and have proven to be active in the uh, picogram uh, ranges, and that's also the case for the anexin peptide as acting as agonists to stimulate resolution and the signs of resolution. So there's considerable potential uh, for translation of the SPMs, and the molecules have all been confirmed now by total organic synthesis, and they're commercially available, and there's many nice papers on inflammation, and many coming from Brazil, I'm pleased to say. Um, mouse, rabbit, mini pigs, those uh, systems that have all been uh, evaluated. Uh, there's organ protection, infection control. There's clear evidence for the SPMs in uh, neurosciences and in pain control. And in controlling pain, they're roughly 100 times more potent than morphine, particularly resolving E1. And in wound repair and uh, tissue uh, repair, there's very good evidence that the SPMs protect from fibrosis and sepsis. They're roughly 100 to 1,000 times more potent in the animal models than traditional non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And more recent evidence with Deepak Panagrahi's lab at the Beth Israel Hospital, we've shown that the SPMs can reduce uh, cancer burden by stimulating resolution of inflammation. So as I mentioned, there's also <clears throat> strong evidence on the role of SPMs in the brain, and particularly in neural inflammation. And we first identified neuroprotectin D1 with uh, Nicholas Bazan's group, and NPD1 enhances neural uh, cell survival. Um, there's very nice work on protection from cognitive decline from the group at Duke, and in Alzheimer's disease of the group from Karolinska, um, and onward. Uh, very exciting work coming up recently from uh, Japan showing evidence that the resolvents can protect uh, from depression um, in uh, animal models and even the proposal that they are acting as neurotransmitters and antidepressants. So what about those resolution indices? So here is that cartoon illustration of neutrophilic infiltration to a site. The red line would illustrate non-resolving inflammation, while the green is uh, the decrease in neutrophilic uh, infiltration and their loss from the site. So this resolution interval is what we consider the midpoint of the loss of the neutrophils from that site. And that's what you want to keep 
an eye on today. We're very interested in this congregation of PMN, this swarming that takes place in different organs because we think that this is the site for collateral tissue damage. And you can think about this system as a form of biochemical resilience, uh, the power of a system to resolve. Uh, I'd like to get that idea out there. And what we learned is that if we treat in an animal model at time zero, of course, with a SPM, we can lower the magnitude of the acute inflammatory response and therefore shorten the R sub I. But we could also treat at the maximum neutrophilic infiltration, which was surprising and could expedite uh, the uh, loss of neutrophils uh, from the site and inflammation. So that we consider this the birth of resolution pharmacology and thinking about agonists to treat uh, inflammation rather than inhibitors. And we learned, as many others have uh, in using animal models, that non-steroidals actually delay resolution. They reduce the uh, amplitude, um, but there's a persistence of uh, leukocytes at the site, as is the case with COX-2 inhibitors, et cetera. And we consider these, and particularly lidocaine, as being resolution toxic. So if we look at a comparison of the SPMs in mouse peritonitis on this slide for their ability to stimulate resolution by shortening that resolution in interval, you can see that at nanograms per mouse, which is very potent, there's a dramatic shortening. And in this case, resolving D3, at least at this point, could shorten by greater than 90% that resolution interval. So I'd like to turn to the biosynthesis and the function and particularly the mechanism of action uh, of uh, the SPMs. So how do SPMs work? Well, this is a novel mechanism of action. The SPMs limit the magnitude and the duration of the acute inflammatory response. This illustration shows us that in, uh, for example, a peritonitis, we have a resolution interval of roughly 20 hours, but with resolving D1 on board, that can be shortened substantially. And that's what these curves look like. So SPMs stimulate macrophage phagocytosis and aphericytosis, and they expedite the removal of debris, microbes, and apoptotic cells. They also counter-regulate the initiators of inflammation. And this is a composite from many, many labs. Now, we first showed that uh, resolvins down-regulate TNF-alpha, and that extends through for COX-2 expression, prostaglandins, uh, dysregulation of uh, the inflammasome assembly, uh, and a number of other parameters that help to expedite uh, resolution, including regulating specific microRNAs. So the SPMs are not immunosuppressive, and I think that this is an important point to think about. So the biosynthesis, we, as I mentioned, found these in mouse models, but it was important for us to work out the biosynthesis with isolated human leukocytes. So eicosapentaenoic acid, which is the marine oil, uh, C20.5, is converted to 18-EP, that's illustrated here, and then on in leukocytes, and particularly neutrophils, on to resolve an E1, then E2 was as a dihydroxy acid, and then E3 was actually born in Tokyo in a uh, former fellow's lab, Makoto Aridas, and that's a diol. Hypoxia actually triggers the release of um, eicosapentaenoic acid in, for example, endothelial cells, and we think that's an important component to uh, activating their biosynthesis. Here are some of the actions we originally described for resolving E1, and the one that's, I think, most important is the upregulation of uh, interleukin-10, which is considered an anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine, and blockage, for example, of platelet uh, aggregation. And as I mentioned, the aspirin uh, acetylation of COX-2 leads to this conversion, 
And in the absence of aspirin, uh, P450 can carry out this reaction to make 18E. We've worked out the um, <clears throat> complete stereochemistry in the biosynthesis, and that's illustrated here. And once 18E is taken up by leukocytes, it's converted to a hydroperoxy at the 5 position by the 5 lipoxygenase, and then on to a 5 6 epoxide by the 5 lipoxygenase. And then this epoxide is converted by the LTA4 hydrolase, which normally makes leukotriene B4, to instead produce resolvent E1. And we've trapped this intermediate uh, and determined its structure by mass spec, as well as the hydrolysis products um, through matching. So, in the exercise of structural elucidation of uh, unknown matter, of dark matter in the universe, we are using mass spectrometry to deduce the structure. And I'll use as an example here resolvent D4. And we could learn from mass spectrometry the <clears throat> positions of the alcohol groups and the overall backbone. Um, and we can work on the biosynthesis and use tracking to determine that biosynthesis and also the origins of oxygen and the isomers, keeping an eye on the function of all of these. But to assign the double bond geometries um, and complete stereochemistry is important to do total organic uh, synthesis um, because changes in the double bond geometry reduce uh, or increase potency of action. And these are produced in small quantities, so it's not possible to do direct NMR. So we developed a matching um, protocol uh, with our part of our uh, program project team. Uh, Nikos Patasis has uh, carried out all the early total organic synthesis, and this is uh, Jeremy Winkler, who synthesized first resolvent D4. A D4 is uh, produced in bone marrow, and uh, we also um, carried a second industry synthesis uh, with collaborators at uh, Cayman Chemical. And resolvent D4 is inactivated by hydrogen abstraction. So once the 17 oxo is formed, it becomes biologically inactive. Also, double bond isomerization uh, are uh, part of. Uh, inactivation, and they are less active biologically. And the confirmed functions then for resolvent D4 are uh, organ protection, they enhance the macrophage phagocytosis, and in whole blood, they enhance uh, phagocytosis by both monocytes and neutrophils, and this is work carried out in this publication in collaboration with uh, Kami Chemical, and this is Dr. Stephania Libreros, who carried out these experiments. So, I know that in Brazil, you're suffering as we have in the U.S. from COVID-19. And COVID-19, a very recent uh, autopsy analysis, has really shown that uh, coagulopathies, intravascular coagulopathies, Coagulopathies play a, an important role in the pathology, specifically in the lung. And we carried out a study of thrombus formation together with uh, Denisa Wagner's group and uh, Shola Jovin and Dia Chepanova here and found that within this mouse model, there's a time-dependent production of the lipid mediators uh, during this uh, deep vein thrombosis uh, progression model. And that if we used resolvents, and particularly resolvent D1, it lowered thrombus uh, burden, reduced the neutrophilic infiltration, and increased apoptosis in this model, as well as stimulating further SPM production. So we found that resolvent D4 was very potent in reducing the severity of the pathology and the deep vein thrombosis. So I, I think that this is something relevant for us to think about in um, in COVID infections. And this is the recent publication together in our collaboration with uh, Denisa Wagner's group uh, from Beth Israel Hospital. So here's the biosynthesis of the protectant and merisins. And I'm quite fascinated with the fact that uh, DHA, if it's abstracted at the 
It's this hydrogen position to insert oxygen, molecular oxygen at the 17. It becomes neuroprotectin D1, and we trap this epoxide intermediate, and this was synthesized and confirmed by Trond Hansen, professor from Oslo, who was on sabbatical with us, through a carbonium cation intermediate, and this was all enzymatic to arrange the double bonds in the desired configuration uh, for the endogenous biologically active neuroprotectin D1. Starting DHA abstraction here, leading to oxygen incorporation at the 14 position, leads to a different epoxide intermediate that we've synthesized with Nikos Patasis' group. This is the Marisin pathway to produce MAR1, which is a potent activator of uh, tissue regeneration. And very recent studies published by Morello here show in this docking experiment how well DHA sits in 15 lipoxygenase, in this case, um, to oxygenate. So here's the complete uh, pathway for the Marisins as we know it uh, today. And these, are, we named them the macrophage mediators in resolving inflammation. And our evidence comes from knockouts and uh, recombinant enzymes. And we've shown that the human macrophage 12 lipoxygenase by cloning the enzyme is the one responsible for producing this first hydroperoxide, which is converted to this epoxide intermediate we call epoxymerizin. And this turned out to be biologically active as well. It undergoes hydrolysis. There's a double dioxygenation product, an isomer of Marisin 1, the pr product in this pathway that we first identified. But that epoxide can also inhibit the 12 lipoxygenase sort of feedback loop, as well as LTA4 hydrolase and stop glucotriene B4 production when MAR1 is produced. And we've studied tissue generation using uh, our friend, the planaria here, which is a, an ideal model for looking at tissue uh, regeneration. So how are the substrates mobilized? Well, in microglia cells, uh, we first found that um, uh, PLA2 is involved in the release of DHA in production of uh, protectin D1, uh, work in my lab as well as uh, work with Nicholas Bazan's group. We also found that during an active infection or inflammation, the essential fatty acids, DHA and EPA, can be carried in as the free fatty acids on carrier proteins into an inflammatory exudate and then converted in a temporal fashion to SPMs and very recently, um, Makoto Murakami's group identified a resolving SPLA2. This is type 2D here. There are many publications from Japan now on this. And we identified with uh, microparticles a resolving SPLA2 with Lucy Norland that's uh, regulating the production of uh, SPMs. So, the cell types involved in producing uh, the SPMs are illustrated here. We think the lion's share during resolution is coming from apoptotic neutrophils, as well as M2 macrophages, and initially leukocyte endothelial cell interactions can produce SPMs as well. And they're produced, if you could see at the bottom of the slide, in organs such as uh, lymph nodes, uh, spleen, etc. To give you an idea of the potency, show an older publication here on resolving D2. It's picograms per mile uh, can stop neutrophilic infiltration in a sequel ligation puncture model. Uh, higher concentration for NO production on endothelial cells here at 10 nanomolar. And work with Dr. Nan Chang uh, on macrophages, where there's a reduction in, in the requirement of antibiotic treatment uh, when SPMs are used because they help to expedite clearance. You can see here um, that they're in pico uh, molar potency 
D1 and D5 on phagocytosis of E. coli. So in general, um, eicosanoids such as PG2 and LTB4 are bioactive in the nanomolar range, whereas the pro-resolving mediators in picomolar, so it's not really the size of that peak on LCMS that matters. These are transient mediators. It's all about the potency and the function. So if we look further into... Can you guys still hear me? If we look, if we look further into M1 and Mmax, which is with Oliver Wurtz when he was on sabbatical, we can clearly see that the M2 macrophage shifts um, in its uh, mediator production, and that's illustrated here. The M2 macrophage on phagocytosis for E. coli makes predominantly SPN. And this uh, gives us the subcellular localization uh, event, um, which is well known that the 5 lipoxygenase docks with the uh, activating protein FLAP to produce leukotrienes. And here, um, the 5 lipoxygenase and 15 LO do not translocate to the nucleus. They interact in the cytosol, as illustrated here, to produce D series resolvents. And this has also been found by Gabriella Fredman in her uh, studies on lipoxins. So there's clear evidence for different subcellular localization to produce uh, different mediators. As I mentioned, bone marrow and lymph nodes are a site of uh, production of the SPMs. So recently with uh, Paul Norris and with uh, Stephania, we looked at uh, the impact of physiologic hypoxia in a hypoxia chamber versus normoxia on production of uh, lipid mediators from M2 macrophages. And in this cytoscape analysis, you can clearly see, I hope, that there's an increase in red here in a number of uh, mediators, uh, predominantly uh, the pro-resolving mediators. What popped out here, which was very interesting, is that <clears throat> there was a novel mediator we've designated uh, resolving E4, and Paul carried out uh, biogenic synthesis illustrated here of resolving E4 using isolated enzymes to get the structure of resolving E4 as proposed. And using inhibitors, he learned that the lipases uh, are involved in liberation from cholesterol estes and triglycerides of EPA in macrophages as well as phospholipids. And we find this very exciting. Um, on the right of this slide is a quantitation from macrophages and neutrophils in hypoxia versus normoxia. And this is physiologic hypoxia. And at the lower part, you see the co-incubation leads to substantial production of the resolving E4 here versus the isolated cells alone. So the Illustration we put together here is that in the spleen and bone marrow and physiologic hypoxia, we think that SPMs and specifically resolvent E4 are involved in uh, ephericytosis of apoptotic neutrophils as well as um, senescent red cells. And during pathologic hypoxia, as in hemorrhagic exudates, uh, the M2 macrophage helps to clear out uh, red blood cells, and this was recently reported in this publication, and a specific role for resolving E4. So how do they act? They act on specific receptors uh, with select stereoselectivity and with nanomolar KD on, expressed on immune cells. First, the resolving D1 receptor interacts with uh, ALX receptor in mouse and human, and in humans, GPR32, and work from Dr. Nan Chang. RVD2 selectively activates GPR18. RVE1 hits 
as a partial agonist antagonist uh, the BLT1 receptor and activates KIMAR23. And very recently, the neuroprotectin D1 receptor was identified. Of course, these are all GPCR receptors, GPR37 by the Duke group. And these three receptors are all qualified using transgenics and uh, knockout mice. And then recently uh, with Dr. Chang, the MAR1 receptor was identified, LGR6 on mononuclear cells and macrophages. So here's the composite from that recent uh, publication. MAR1 activates LGR6 on monocytes and macrophages to enhance phagocytosis as well as of E. coli and apoptotic PMN activating cyclic AMP as illustrated here. We're very excited about this because uh, LGR6 uh, is known as a marker for stem cells, so stay tuned. There's work continuing in this area. So what about <clears throat> regulation? So here is the phagocytosis of live E. coli, and we learned that resolvin block inflammasome as well as lipoxin, particularly lipoxin B4, um, and this is the phagocytosis of dead cells. And on the right, this is an illustration of work from Korea, from HANA, a very nice paper, showing that resolvin D1 activates a phosphorylation cascade to assemble P5050, turning off TNF-alpha and activating a ferrocytosis. When resolvin D1 is uh, exposed to the cells first, and then a pro-inflammatory stimulus uh, is uh, engaged, there's a blockade of the phosphorylation site. So this is a very nice uh, uh, publication and lots of work on the signal transduction now on, uh, from many groups around the world on the uh, SPMs. So as I've shown you, there's a uh, a lot of excitement around the resolvents and uh, the protectants and MAR1 and their actions in animal models. There's over a thousand publications on the resolvents now from many groups um, and uh, 2,000 or so on lipoxins. Uh, one of the more interesting ones is the regulation of aortic aneurysms from Mike Conti's group and as I pointed out, the uh, counter-regulation of pain uh, by MAR1 and the resolvents, very exciting uh, work in the future. So what about the human relevance? Well, it's all about when and where that counts, and uh, we've systematically and a number of groups have reported uh, where uh, SPMs are found, for example, in brain and uh, placenta, work from Australia, Trevor Morey's group, uh, bone marrow, as I mentioned, tears, uh, emotional tears. Uh, very recently, we reported that. Um, breast milk, um, a number of groups have shown that breast milk contain SPMs. And very recent data from Japan looking at the osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis and synovial exudates and where SPMs are identified and earlier work from uh, Australia on uh, rheumatoid arthritis and synovial fluid, including urine uh, from uh, Japan. So th there's a picture emerging at which tissues produce SPM. So I want to talk about uh, our human translation and functional decoding metabolomics. And we've now operationalized our system using automated extraction uh, for solid phase, and then LC chromatography. This is an illustration of the signature uh, that one would see. We're using a LC MSMS quadrupole. We've developed a database, uh, which we've made available on the lab website uh, to identify uh, with diagnostic ions each of the SPMs, as well as a number of other lipid mediators, and then eventually do principal component analysis. And we um, don't try to measure everything. We're focused. This is targeted on roughly 65 or so. Uh, molecules that uh, give us ideas about the activation of these pathways. 
So we think that this is an example of personalized um, uh, medicine, perhaps uh, to come in the near future. So this is how we illustrate the uh, metabolomes on which uh, products are, are identified. And this is composite uh, serum from uh, the National Institutes of Standards. Uh, and we could see all the prostaglandins produced in human serum, um, the lipoxins, the leukotrienes, the E-series resolvins illustrated here, and the DHA uh, metabolome the resolvins, the D-series maresins, and the protectins. Um, and what's important about these illustrations are what's not present, for example, in a particular tissue. We validated this recently uh, in um, a uh, coded blinded study with uh, Raul Matapani's group at Wayne State and the group at, um, at University of, uh, excuse me, at Penn State, uh, Penny Chris Everton. And, and Scully Ray, and these were healthy individuals with low-dose endotoxin supplemented with uh, two different protocols of uh, omega-3, and we validated uh, using coded samples the identification of the SPMs with uh, Dr. Matapani, and this was led in our group by Dr. Paul Norris. So using this system, we now wanted to turn can we stimulate resolution of inflammation in, you, in humans? And this model, this blister uh, of attenuated bacteria is introduced by Professor Derek Gilroy, which is known to many of you. He's in the UK, an early resolutionist. And here is the illustration on the forearm. And we now have this uh, up and running in Boston with Dr. Levy's group as well. And you can see here with laser Doppler, uh, the increased blood flow, uh, and then the resolution by day three. So using this uh, exudate that's formed, one can do flow cytometry, and that's illustrated here. And it looks just like the original mouse air pouch with uh, neutrophils coming in and then leaving, and monocytes and macrophages and lymphocytes coming on board. So we were able to take this uh, inflammatory exudate from human blisters uh, and profile them for prostaglandins, the EPA products, and DHA, DHA SPMs. And that's illustrated here. They were identified by full MS-MS. Uh, and what's interesting is that at time zero, it looks like there's a clock of lipid mediators at four hours. You see mostly prostaglandins and leukotrienes, and then it moves on to produce SPMs into resolution. And so what we, were, we could do with Dr. Gilroy, uh, which we couldn't do in Boston, was actually to add back the SPMs we identified at the site and found that the injection in these healthy donors led to reduced uh, neutrophils at the site. And so there's an acceleration of resolution with SPMs added back. And this is a human data set we're very excited about. So in using this E. coli attenuated model, study inflammation, acute uh, initiation and resolution, and the data clearly show that SPMs given back at the levels in which they produce help to expedite resolution. So what about the vagus? So we became very interested in Kevin Tracy's research, and Kevin has shown, and he's a neurosurgeon by training, that vagotomy actually heightens the acute inflammatory response. And when we did this in, with uh, vagotomy and peritonitis, we found that there was, of course, a big increase in the acute inflammatory response as measured by neutrophilic infiltration, but there was also clearly a dysregulation of resolution. And we could add back resolvins and then correct that uh, loss of the vagus nerve stimulation. 
So it turns out that the vagus has been studied for some time, as many of you know, uh, and potentially as a therapeutic for humans and in experimental models. And the data goes both ways, but we were really drawn by this paper here from Koopman on uh, the use of vagal stimulation and this in, in rheumatoid arthritis patients with very clear evidence of reduced inflammation. And Kevin Tracy and um, Paul Peter Tack proposed this model here of uh, regulation of macrophage, counter-regulation of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines as through vagal stimulation. And this is a slide that Paul Peter Tack gave me um, where they um, proposed that vagus has a uh, role in regulating uh, chronic inflammation through a cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway through the uh, acetylcholine receptor. So, simulated by this uh, uh, human data, we were able to get human vagus and look at human vagus ex vivo in this post-autopsy. And what we found is uh, the presence of uh, NPD1 and MAR1 is illustrated here and select resolvents, D3, D4, no D6, and D5. And this is work we carried out with Charlotte Jovine and uh, Dr. Javier De La Rosa here. And this is the cytoscape. And the quantitation here is shown by the size of the uh, circle. So no D1 or D2, but other SPMs are produced by the vagus. That's shown quantitatively here for the human vagus. If we electrically stimulated that vagus ex vivo, we saw increases. We we're very excited about that in SPMs. And we also saw increases with E. coli co-incubation, live E. coli with uh, the vagus ex vivo. We also found evidence for lipoxins, triines, and prostaglandins as well being produced by uh, human vagus ex vivo. We also looked into mice, uh, three different uh, mouse strains as illustrated here. And there's a slight difference. The mice produce more pro-resolving uh, mediators than humans. And we were surprised to find that, but roughly it's very similar to uh, humans. And so on electrical stimulation of the vagus in uh, the mouse, you can see very clear shift here to pro-resolving mediated production. We're very excited to see that. And that's just uh, 18 volts, 20 minute at uh, 2.5 milliamps. Here are the quantitative data for the mouse. You can see clear increases in SPMs, but surprisingly, a reduction in prostaglandins. And so electrical stimulation, the bioelectric medicine is acting, we think, as a non-steroidal would and turns off prostaglandin production. And here's the quantitative data in the lower frame. We also found that the mouse vagus produced cystinyl leukotrienes, and that was a big surprise because the cystinyl leukotrienes, as you know, are thought to be important in bronchial constriction and asthma. And on electrical stimulation, that is reduced as well. So we're very intrigued by uh, this result. So that's illustrated here in this slide prepared by Dr. De La Rosa. We think that electrical vagus stimulation turns on local SPM production and then blocks prostaglandin generation. So is there translational potential? And uh, at the end of this talk, I just want to talk about um, the confirmed functions in humans and what about resolution pharmacology? So as you know, uh, many of you are uh, world leaders in pharmacology. There really hasn't been any change in, in the thinking about how to control inflammation since the time of Hippocrates. 
basically inhibitors that eventually become immunosuppressive. And so we think that the SPMs uh, could be helpful in, in alleviating some of the uh, unwanted side effects seen with traditional uh, pharmacological approach. And I was reminded by a Greek colleague of mine recently that Hippocrates also said, let food be your medicine, which I didn't know, and I thought that was quite fun to hear. In many uh, human uh, studies uh, from a number of groups, it's been shown that SPMs are reduced during specific diseases, and that's illustrated here. So the approach that we've taken is to make uh, stable analogs of the uh, resolve. And since we have receptors, and some of them are illustrated here, and some have proven to be rather potent uh, in animal models as agonists and mimetics, that's because they re <coughs> resist this rapid inactivation that uh, on the, goes with the prostaglandin dehydrogenase. So this is very similar to the inactivation pathways for the prostaglandins. So if we put in, for example, this uh, parafluoro phenoxy derivative at this position, it prevents the dehydrogenation and is potent as an agonist in vivo. So we think that these immunoresolvents may be useful. There have been a number of trials <coughs> reported in the literature on lipoxins, uh, for example, in DERM, um, a company that uh, I was or originally involved in initiating, did a study with uh, Resolvent E1 um, mimetic in uh, phase one, phase two in dry eye inflammation that was positive in more than 260 patients. Very recently, we focused our efforts on periodontal disease as a new approach to preventing um, leukocyte-mediated tissue damage as seen here in the periodontium, and this is a big public health uh, problem. And uh, with uh, Tom Van Dyke over the years, um, we made a, a mouth rinse that they studied at the foresight and have positive results that they are writing up now for publication, and here's the, the study. And there are groups out there right now, companies working on neuroprotecting D1 and uh, resolving D1 in, in IBD. So we hope that this uh, continues uh, to show us a way to use resolution as a new means to approaching inflammation. One of the ones which is rather exciting is this uh, anabasum, which is a CB2 agonist. And this is work that we did with uh, Derek Gilroy's group in that blister model where the CB2 agonist in vivo in the blister enhanced uh, SPM production and it regulated uh, neutrophil uh, recruitment. So this is another approach uh, of value to uh, consider. We also have made nanoprobe-resolving medicines, and we base that off the finding uh, that there are nanoparticles produced in the resolution phase that are uh, anti-inflammatory, work that we did with uh, Lucy Norland when she was uh, in the lab, and we've used them to package SPMs and SPM analogs uh, and demonstrated that this is another approach uh, to developing uh, new therapeutics. We try to stabilize the molecule, make them simpler to produce, and this is work with uh, NCATS that uh, Dr. Nan Chang uh, led in, in my group, and here's Resolving D1 docking on its receptor, and here's a benzo analog that we had found is uh, uh, easier to synthesize less steps, uh, and also docks uh, within the receptor. Very recently, I was very excited to see this uh, <clears throat> from a Japanese group reporting on uh, resolving E2 using this approach and made a stable uh, benzo analog of resolving E2. Um, and they found that this is very potent in the femtogram 
uh, as the benzo E2. And so we hope that this will stimulate uh, companies uh, into moving into uh, examining resolving E2. So in closing, uh, of course, we have to say something about COVID-19. And this is a recent uh, paper where we wrote uh, with our colleagues, uh, Deepak Panagrahi, that we thought one approach to consider would be the SPMs. That's a hypothesis to reduce uh, cytokine storms, as well as using the soluble epoxide hydrolase inhibitor to increase uh, EET production. And the thinking here is uh, straightforward, that you know that the, the ARDS uh, in COVID is uh, thought to be uh, tr really triggered by uh, the aberrant cytokine storm, triggered by the virus, leading to leakage permeability changes, as well as uh, blood clots. And so we think here that uh, increasing SPMs and increasing EETs through this uh, approach could uh, at least theoretically be beneficial. So today I told you about what we think about the resolution metabolome and illustrated the pathways, the receptors that we know of today, and the signs of resolution which we've introduced that are uh, regulated by the SPMs. And certainly this is just the tip of the iceberg and there are probably many, many mediators that help to orchestrate resolution. But I think from our studies, what we have learned is that <clears throat> pro-resolution is a new bioaction carried by the SPMs. Anti-inflammation is not equivalent to pro-resolution. We carried out the structural elucidation of this previously unknown dark matter in the universe coming from the N3 uh, essential fatty acids. And we've introduced functional decoding metabolomics to help us guide the way in, in, in human uh, studies. And we learned recently about electrical stimulation regulating eicosanoids and also increasing SPM production which we think occurs locally. So we think that the SPMs, their receptors, are involved in regulating inflammation and infection in resolution physiology, but that we could also use this information to venture into resolution pharmacology. So I want to thank the members of my lab and former colleagues as well as the members of my program project team, which I have the pleasure of working with over the years. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, I hope it was clear. And if it's an opportunity, I can take questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Sahan. Um, it was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, um, Median asked me to uh, take over the the questions portion of the of the presentation, and uh, we have uh, a few questions that uh, were basically put on uh, the YouTube chat. But uh, for the ones that are watching through the Google Meet. They can also uh, put their, their questions in English or in Portuguese uh, in, the, in the chat of uh, Google Meet. But uh, uh, in YouTube, we had a question about uh, how uh, these uh, uh, SPMs could play a role in Alzheimer's uh, disease, especially uh, if they are made by uh, microglia and uh, if they, they play a role in these conditions? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And we first started to look at Alzheimer's brain with uh, Nicholas Bazan and his group at LSU. And he's in the neuroscience center there. And we found that there was a, a, a decrease uh, in Alzheimer's of uh, the ability to produce neuroprotectin D1. And we carried that work on with uh, Marian Schulzberg at Karolinska Institute, and we looked 
a human brain, uh, that they have uh, a healthy human brain compared to Alzheimer's brain at the Karolinska. And again, we found decreased uh, ability in Alzheimer's disease to produce um, the SPMs, in particular neuroprotecting D1. So how do we think that they work? Well, Marianne Schulzberg and a number of other groups have shown that the SPMs stimulate um, the uptake of A-beta and uh, the clearance of A-beta uh, reducing Alzheimer's plaque uh, in model systems. So we think that that's how uh, the SPMs can work um, in uh, reducing uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so I direct you to Marianne Schulzberg's recent publications. She's also recently looked at the SPM receptors in human brain and shown that they are distributed around the human brain. And I think that's really exciting. Um, right. Uh, thank you. I uh, actually, I have a question of, uh, of my own. Um, it shows um, several of the enzymes that are involved in the uh, specific synthesis of these uh, mediators. Uh, but uh, uh, what do we know about the, the flow of uh, the substrates inside of the cells that allow uh, one cell to make uh, SPMs but uh, do not make, uh, for example, uh, uh, prostaglandins? Um, at the same time, like uh, uh, what happens when the vagus is uh, stimulated that uh, it can actually switch the type of uh, mediator that is being produced at that particular time? Yeah, that, that's a really uh, astute question. Um, so, of course, uh, Bruno, both the, the, the pathways that we've described are, are completely dependent on the availability of EPA and DHA and also N3DPA. But there appears to be two different systems operating. Uh, at least in my mind, I think about it as, as the data, we get more data and understand more about the system. In, in the nervous tissue, we know that DHA is normally sequestered, even when there's a very low uh, consumption. Uh, you know that, that we don't produce either EPA or DHA. We have to take it in from the diet. And in, in tissues like the brain and neurons, they sequester DHA. So under those circumstances, when there's activation, I think that these are parallel pathways where there is one designed specifically to release DHA that's agonist driven to produce SPMs from the nerve, for example. In peripheral blood cells, though, it's quite different. And in the peripheral blood cells, one has to take up EPA and DHA presumably into phospholipids, but as I mentioned, at sites of inflammation, if there's a good tone, let's put it that way, of EPA and DHA present in peripheral blood, they'll flow into the system. So if we have a diet that's, that's rich, uh, and you know that most of our diets are, dev are very Western and they're devoid of enough omega-3s, if we, let's say if we are enriched in omega-3s, I think that these are separate systems and they are temporally regulated. We see them as the same enzymes at this point, but I think that that data set on the topological separation that comes from Ira Tabas's group and uh, Gabby Fredman and macrophages and also uh, Oliver Wirt's group is really telling us that there, there are for example, enzymes that are sequestered in subcellular compartments to specifically address the production of SPMs. And that's, of course, hypothetical at this point. It's uh, hard to prove. But I think in years to come, that's what the data is going to show us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions from, from YouTube. 
Uh, this one is from uh, Clarissa Maya. Uh, some painful diseases, such as, as uh, fibromyalgia, you evolve uh, with the chronic pain in the absence of evident inflammation. Could it be caused by basal resolving deficiency? Is there any known relation between resolvents and these diseases? Um, ooh, uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> Yes, uh, I've seen papers, uh, we have not in my group worked at all on fibromyalgia, but I have seen publications on fibromyalgia suggesting that there's a, 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 an absence of SPMs, uh, a resolution defect, if you will, um, and that adding back resolvents, particularly resolvent E1 and D1 uh, in the animal model, uh, which I don't really think that there's a good animal model for fibromyalgia, but at least in the publication, they, they presented that this could reduce pain. So at least the thought is out there in animal models, but we, we of course, we need a lot more evidence to speculate that that might be the case in humans, um, but, but potentially very likely, you know, why not? Sure. And uh, we have uh, another question from uh, Julia Sharfstein. Uh, what is known about uh, SPMs and uh, angiogenesis? Um, view from the perspective of intracellular pathogens, is, is it known how they caught SPMs to increase survival? An example of pathological outcome. I guess it's a two-part question. One is uh, what is known about uh, ES uh, SPMs and uh, angiogenesis, and uh, the other is about the intracellular pathogens and how these uh, intracellular pathogens that are known to co-opt the, the cellular system, they could also co-opt uh, SPMs for their uh, benefits. Yeah, uh, that's a concept. The second is a concept I'm very interested in because it seems at least we did some early work uh, many years ago with uh, Alan Shear's group on uh, Toxo, Toxoplasma Gandhi, that, uh, that Toxo had learned to use the lipoxin system to its benefit. Um, there's not much work in that area. I, I, I think that a lot more is needed and I, and I, I couldn't speculate, but as I, as I said in the introduction, um, you know, Patricia Boza and Christiani, they have the paper showing that in Leishmania, there's uh, apparently resolvent D1 can help the proliferation of the, of, of the parasite. In terms of angiogenesis, though, in cancer models, we know that the SPMs in, in mouse models uh, reduce local angiogenesis around the side of the tumor. And this has recently been shown in Heinlein ischemia model. The paper just came out yesterday in PNAS from Matt Spite's group where resolvent D1 has been shown to regulate uh, uh, angiogenesis. So I, I think it's a very important question in both scenarios in the pathology of uh, cancer as well as in parasite but it, it's very early days and there's i can i can reference back to some early work that we did with uh dr yolanda ferrera who i know is online there when she was with us on lipoxins uh that the lipoxin can regulate uh angiogenesis by regulating the vegf receptor um, but that level of work, as far as I know, has not yet been carried out with uh, the resolvents or the other SPMs. Right. I have uh, another question here by Dr. Uh, Patricia Martins. Uh, do you have evidence of the potential effectiveness of SPMs on chronic lung inflammatory diseases, mainly those of fibrotic nature, such as uh, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, uh, IPF, and others as uh, pneumoconiosis? Uh, in those two specific diseases, no. But they're, they're, um, I do not have uh, data from my lab, but there's very nice data pr 
published by Patricia Symes Lab. Uh, she's a pulmonologist and she's in Virginia now and she has shown in a uh, smoke-induced model of chronic inflammation and lung fibrosis that the SPMs can prevent that, at least in the mouse model. And, um, and also Bruce Levy's lab has been looking at uh, chronic inflammation as well and he's shown that a number of the SPMs can uh, reduce and prevent that. There are published papers on renal fibrosis that I've seen from other groups that show that uh, resolvins can prevent renal fibrosis. Uh, so I do think that if we could uh, dampen the uh, chronic inflammation and expedite resolution, that it will have a beneficial effect long term on uh, organ fibrosis. Uh, but, of course, that remains to be seen uh, in anything more than the mouse models that have been used at this time. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. We have a, a, a question now uh, um, going back to the uh, neurological aspects of the role of these uh, mediators. Uh, one is uh, if there is any evidence of uh, uh, the reduction of SPMs uh, with age, and uh, if it uh, may relate to uh, um, uh, neuro de neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, the other is uh, about also the uh, neurological aspects of infectious diseases such as uh, Zika, for example. Well, the last question is easy. I know nothing about Zika, and I haven't seen any papers along those lines. Um, the neurodegenerative disease aspect, I think, is uh, very interesting. I think some of the acute models for cognitive decline uh, that Nicola Tarando has published uh, are inflammation driven. Uh, he uses a bone fracture model to induce a cognitive decline. That's an example of uh, surgical induced cognitive decline. And there, the SPMs have been shown to prevent cognitive decline. And I think that's very exciting because that's an important uh, unmet medical need. Uh, as far as aging goes, we did look at, in my lab, with, uh, with Hilda Arnadat when she was uh, in the lab. She's at the Karolinska Institute now in Stockholm. And we looked at the NIH uh, uh, mice, uh, a, the, the aged mice versus young mice. And we did that uh, in the acute inflammation setting. And what we saw, as one might expect, that there's a heightened acute inflammatory response. Um, and, but, but the surprise there was that there was a loss in aging of the SPMs. And we could add back resolvins, at least in the mouse model, and correct that uh, age-induced defect. Um, but I, I, I don't know about uh, specific neurodegenerative diseases um, in terms of uh, the study of uh, SPMs. I haven't uh, seen any, um, and apart from the ones that I've mentioned for, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a, a Parkinson's disease uh, study that was published uh, with our collaborators from Italy. And uh, the Parkinson's disease community is just beginning to realize that neuroinflammation is playing an important role there. And the resolvins added in the animal model could, could prevent that by, again, counter-regulation of uh, the chemokines and cytokines and reducing local inflammation. But human studies uh, I haven't seen yet, and they're a challenge because of the nature of the neurodegenerative disease and timeline. All right. Uh, uh, every time that uh, uh, someone talks about, and uh, I guess you sh should get these uh, questions all the time, uh, that uh, talks about uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids derived mediators, 
uh, it comes back to our diet and uh, and how uh, our diets um, uh, actually uh, promote um, inflammation or they can uh, inhibit uh, inflammation. And uh, uh, if uh, we should all all be taking uh, DHA supplements uh, to make sure that uh, we have enough uh, SPMs to to go around. Yeah, I think uh, the, there's very good studies uh, from Japan. Uh, the diet in Japan is very uh, marine oriented, so the levels. Uh, are documented to be higher in Japan for uh, EPA and DHA in peripheral tissues than arachidonic acid. And um, a number of studies have, have, have shown from Japan that, uh, you know, the SPMs uh, uh, are playing a beneficial role. So I, I do think that the bottom line from what we've learned is is that uh, the innate immune system, as you would guess, is under nutrient control, just like other organisms, and that it's important for us and that evolutionarily um, the system was, was, was evolved, I should say, to have an adequate amount of EPA and DHA and that our Western diets have... Um, We've lost this, and I, I do have a slide that I got. Uh, there are a lot of experts that have studied this, and uh, there's always been a discussion about the mechanisms of EPA or DHA, um, and that's where I think our uh, contributions are relevant um, to give mechanisms. Um, but are we still on screen share? Can you see this slide? Hello? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so th this slide is from uh, Artemis Simonopoulos, and she uh, devoted her career to trying to educate people, and she was at NIH. Uh, and uh, I think the pediatricians understand this very well. Um, and this is the timeline uh, from her publication of where we stood, and this is, a, a, of course, an extrapolation uh, from hunter-gatherer populations, and where our ratio is today in this industrial era. Um, and here are some of the ratios of N6 to N3 in the Paleolithic era that uh, Dr. Simonopoulos put together. And you can see how dramatic it, it, it is. Uh, on different countries. Now, United States is here. I don't know where Brazil is today. Um, someday I'll get to Brazil and I'll find out what, you, what you're eating um, as well as listen to the music. But uh, I would imagine that it's probably similar to uh, this U.S., that we're on the wrong side of this ratio and that we really need to increase our consumption. Now, it's debatable if, if we, if, what is the best form to take uh, the omega-3s? And I, that I think it's still too early days to tell. Is it supplementation or do we have to find ways of enriching our diet? So um, that's all I have, I, I can say at this point. Right, so uh, one, one final uh, question, if you please. Um, uh, what uh, uh, would you say to someone that, uh, uh, after watching uh, your presentation, decides to uh, study uh, SPMs? Uh, how should uh, uh, one start uh, studying these uh, molecules? What kind of uh, resources uh, uh, they are available? Uh, for example, uh, there was one question here by Marcelo Lamas uh, asking if there is uh, uh, a database for uh, interpretation of the uh, MS uh, data uh, and uh, identification of uh, ESPMs in, in, the, in the spectrum, in the MS spectrum. But uh, uh, in 
in general, uh, uh, for someone that is uh, um, interested now, uh, how should they start? So what's, uh, what's the next big thing that people should, uh, should look for? Well, okay, so there's a couple of things. First of all, I see a lot of great papers coming from Brazil and the long tradition in pharmacology. And uh, a lot of that is driven, the good news is uh, that the, all of the SPMs, essentially all of them, are commercially available now. And uh, in the beginning, uh, it was very hard to synthesize because uh, some of the synthesis of 20, 25 steps and then send samples to people around the world. Uh, but now there are several companies that have uh, overcome that barrier and, and, and there are uh, ample sources out there. So you can buy resolvents and you can test them in all sorts of systems. Um, the receptors are known, so you can clearly look for receptor expression or what I favor is uh, interrogating different uh, populations, uh, disease populations, disease cohorts to see if the receptor expression is diminished, if there is a quote-unquote resolution defect, and if that goes along with uh, reduced consumption of uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids. On the database side, the, um, we, as, I, as I mentioned, we've made a full uh, MS-MS Spectra book that is uh, available as a download on my website, uh, for the lab website. The or the, the actual fingerprint of each molecule, the diagnostic ions are there. Uh, this is all under uh, ideal, of course, circumstances um, with uh, pure uh, resolvents. And so with that information available, certainly people could interrogate if they have uh, LCMSMS data, uh, untargeted or targeted, they could interrogate at least initially, um, the presence or absence of the SPMs and uh, in a particular sample. And then uh, one would need to go further to establish uh, a role uh, in a particular system. So I think we're still at very early days. And Bruno, you're an expert in the area. And uh, uh, it, it, we're still learning things about leukotrienes and prostaglandins that we didn't know. And I think it's going to take us uh, uh, decades and certainly more scientific lives than just mine to, <laughs> to figure out what we have are the pieces now of the puzzle and the puzzle needs to be put together. We need a lot of people in the area. And so if anybody wants to contact me and ask questions specifically, I'd be happy to give you, you know, my thoughts. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, thoughts are cheap. It's getting the data that really counts. <laughs> so if you, I'm sure the, the questions around the parasites will be very important. Questions about metastasis were very important. Um, questions about neurobiology, whether the SPMs really are endogenous neurotransmitters. There's, there's a lot to be done. All right. Um, I thank you, you again. It was uh, a very nice talk, very uh, uh, enlightening for, for everybody, very clear. And uh, I thank for, for everybody that uh, uh, stuck with us uh, this late. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Sahan also has to go to, to his lunch, and uh, as, uh, as uh, we all. And uh, we had uh, a brief moment of uh, uh, during the streaming that uh, the YouTube feed uh, froze. Uh, I apologize for that. But uh, the, the complete uh, uh, presentation will be available uh, as uh, it was uh, recorded directly from the, from the Google Meet uh, feed to the Google server. So uh, we managed to, to, to keep that. Uh, I can see, and uh, you probably can see it as well, Dr. Fierro, 
uh, is, is uh, with us now live on screen. It's, uh, it's very nice to see you. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. It was nice. Thank nice you. Nice to see you, Yolanda. I hope all is going well. Yes. Next time in person, Charlie. Yes, I have to. I have to get a dose of uh, Brazilian jazz. I, I, I st it's, it's on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've, I've been trying to get him here, but uh, you know, uh, we have to. I know that. Him, uh, uh, virtually here uh, in Brazil, but uh, it's it's a very poor substitute to actually be it's here so and uh, uh, listen to some of uh, our local music. Well, yeah, but it's a start, Bruno. Thanks. It, it is, yeah. When when things calm down and the world gets back to some place, some new normal, <laughs> I yeah. hope people yeah. come and, and visit. And I know there's a lot of great science in Brazil, and there's there really is much to be done uh, because the the work has taught us, at least it's taught me, how important it is to to work with colleagues that are nutritionists that. That, that work from a different perspective. And we're making tools available to now interrogate uh, what I think would be really important in uh, personalized medicine and just general health in the future. Uh, is to be able to, I mean, I believe in this uh, very much that it's important to have a good uh, level of SPM production. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Time again. Ciao. Thanks so Bye. much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Work from a different perspective, and we're making tools available to now interrogate. Uh, Cristiano, o microfone está aberto. Really important in...